PCA is an example of linear dimensionality reduction. That means it finds a linear transformation to a low dimensional representation. There are many such linear dimensionality reduction methods, and they differ in terms of the assumptions that they make on the data. One example is probabilistic PCA, which is similar to PCA, but it includes an explicit noise model. It assumes that the noise is uh, Gaussian with, a, uh, with the same variance in each direction. Another example is factor analysis, uh, which is similar to PPCA, uh, but it allows the variance to be different in different directions. Uh, so different methods can also have different features of the data that they're looking for. For example, linear discriminant analysis looks for a low dimensional subspace that preserves class discriminatory information. Uh, this is useful when you have labeled data, and it's an example of supervised dimensionality reduction in contrast to PCA or the other methods that I'm talking about today, which are unsupervised. In this example, the black data points correspond to stimulus 1, and the uh, gray data points correspond to stimulus 2. So running PCA, you would find this uh, direction that captures uh, most of the variance in the full data set. And if you... Uh, run LDA, you would find the direction that captures uh, information about the two stimuli. So LDA can be very useful when looking for directions that represent uh, information about um, different stimuli or different behavior in your neural data set. These methods are related to another class of methods uh, that are used to solve blind source separation problems. These are problems where you have some data that are mixtures of uh, different signals, and you want to recover those signals by demixing your data. Uh, for example, um, this could be useful uh, in pre-processing neural data like an EEG. The canonical example is independent uh, components analysis, uh, which finds components that are statistically independent. Uh, this is a stronger condition than them being uncorrelated, which is uh, what PCA finds. In this example, there's clearly two different um, signals uh, that, are, uh, that are responsible for the data points that you see, uh, but PCA will not be able to find um, those two uh, signals, uh, and you need to use ICA in order to recover them. Uh, notice that the basis vectors are not necessarily orthogonal. Another example is non-negative matrix factorization, uh, which is useful when you have positive data because it assumes that your weights and components are positive. Uh, this can also make your results much more interpretable. Uh, geometrically speaking, it finds uh, basis vectors that are on the edges of a cone that contains all of your data points. Uh, and if you run PCA, then you'll uh, find uh, components that have positive and negative uh, values that could be very difficult to interpret. Again, the basis vectors here are not necessarily orthogonal. When are linear methods not enough? Here's an example of a data set that is clearly one dimensional, uh, but uh, that dimension is curved. So if you run PCA, you will not find that uh, S-shaped curve because it's explicitly looking for a linear uh, representation. Instead, what you want to find is this S shape um, in which the data points are embedded. In neuroscience, we often call this a neural manifold. Uh, a neural manifold is a, a smooth, low dimensional structure uh, in which your data points are embedded in your high dimensional space. This is where nonlinear methods kick in. Uh, they don't usually find the equations for the manifold, um, but they find uh, a mapping um, to a low dimensional embedding. And this mapping is chosen in order to preserve um, some information in the structure of the data. Uh, for example, information about uh, the locality of uh, different data points. Uh, in particular, uh, many of these methods um, try to map uh, data points that are uh, close together in your high dimensional space uh, to also be close together in your low dimensional embedding. There are many different types of nonlinear dimensionality reduction methods, all with their own uh, positives and negatives. And in this final exercise, you'll use one called T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, or T-SNE. T-SNE is very useful for visualization of high-dimensional data in two or three dimensions. 
On the right is an example of TSNE applied to transcriptomic data of neocortical cell types. And you can see that uh, the different cell types, uh, the data is clustered together in this TSNE embedding. On the left, you don't quite see that same type of um, clustering of different data types if you just look at the first two principal components. Unlike uh, the other methods I've talked about, TSNE is stochastic, meaning if you run it twice, you may get different results for your embedding. You also can't reconstruct the data in the same way that you can in PCA. And finally, TSNE has a free parameter uh, called the perplexity, which roughly speaking uh, balances uh, the local versus global information that's considered in finding this embedding. And as you'll see in the next exercise, uh, this perplexity parameter can have a large impact on the uh, results that you see. So now it's your turn to apply TSNE to the MNIST dataset.